Would you pray with me, please? Sovereign Lord, instruct my tongue that I may know the word that sustains the weary. Waken our ears to listen to what you have to teach us today. Amen. There's a lot of different ways to look at the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament. One of the ways that I like to think about it is the New Testament tells us how to live, and the Old Testament gives us examples of what it looks like to live according to God's teaching, or maybe more often than not, how not to live according to what God teaches, because there's a lot of negative examples in the uh, Old Testament. Today, though, we're going to be looking at one of the positive examples. We're going to be looking at the story of Naomi and Ruth. But there's a few things to keep in mind when we're reading this story. The first thing to keep in mind is that the Israelites and the Moabites were bitter enemies. Moab is that country in pink off there, and where all the names are, that's where Israel is, of course. During the Israelite exodus, the Moabites deceived the Israelites. They attacked them. They even tried to call curses down upon them from heaven. Now, God turned those curses into blessings, but that's a whole other story. In fact, the Moabites even got special mention in the Old Testament law. No Ammonite or Moabite or any of their descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord, not even to the 10th generation. These Moabites are so bad, they can't even join the people of God. And after Naomi and Ruth's time, these two neighboring kingdoms were always at each other's throats, fighting with each other, waging wars against each other. So the first thing to keep in mind is Israelites and Moabites get together like, what, cats and dogs, oil and vinegar. You pick the example. Second thing to keep in mind, in the ancient world, in that region, women had no independent rights. If you were a woman, tough luck. You needed a man in order to legitimize you. You needed a male relative to give you a place in society. Society was organized by households. Who could be the head of a household? Only a man. If, and if you're a woman, you need to find a man to be part of a household, a male relative. Of course, as a child, you're growing up in your father's household. When you get married, you're in your husband's household. If your husband dies, you can be in your son's household or your brother's household or something along those lines. What happens, though, if you have no male relative, no close male relative, no father, no son, no brother, no husband? What, what do you do? Right, that's exactly it. You're out of luck. Or maybe if you're lucky, you'll find some distant relative who's willing to take you into his household. Now, if you're young and healthy, it's more likely that they'll bring you into, your, into their household because you have something to offer. You can be a productive member of that household. But if you're old and lame, probably not, because you're just going to be a drain on that family's assets, and they're not going to want you. So, Moabites bad. Women, less than dirt. Third, times of famine in those days were life-threatening. This is long before the days of crop insurance, long before days of food banks and food pantries. Most of the people in that time and place were subsistence farmers or herders. If you wanted to eat, you had to grow it or raise it yourself. And if you couldn't grow it, if you couldn't raise it, then you starve. There is nothing to fall back on during the hard times. So, Moabites bad. Women, tough luck. Famine, awful. You with me so far? All right, now the story, even though the book's named after Naomi, I'm the, oh, sorry, the book's named after Ruth, the story starts with Naomi. Naomi lived in Bethlehem. Yeah, that's the same Bethlehem of the Christmas story, just a thousand years earlier. And Naomi married a man named Elimelech. Naomi and Elimelech had two sons. And this was the greatest blessing a woman at that time could ever hope for. Because a son can carry on the family name. The family's going to go on. And plus, whenever your husband dies, now you have a son who will take care of you. And she didn't just have one son, she had two sons. What do they say in the royal family when Prince Harry was born? They have an heir and a spare. 
However, the first hint of trouble comes up with the names of her sons, Malon and Kilion. You might think, so what? Until you know what Malon and Kilion mean in Hebrew, the language that they spoke. Malon means sickness, and Kilion means wasting away. Now, I will say, I hope that these are the kids' nicknames. I cannot imagine parents giving monikers like this to their kids. So anyway, so we have the family of four now, right? And then famine struck. When famine hit, you needed to do whatever you could to survive. Now, they heard that there was still food in Moab. Remember those evil, nasty, terrible Moabites? They're the nation's enemy. So what are you going to do? Are you going to stay home and starve? Or are you going to go to the enemy territory to find food? They decided to suck it up and go to Moab. They might be the nation's enemies. They might be pariahs there. People might look at them and spit at them and call them nasty names. But at least they could find something to eat. So they went to Moab and lived there as refugees. While they're in Moab, Elimelech dies. Now, fortunately for, Noah, for Naomi, she still had two sons, right? So she wasn't on her own. And while they're in Moab, both of her sons married Moabite women, Ruth and Orpah. I imagine that probably raised some eyebrows for an Israelite and a Moabite to marry each other, but they did. So, looking pretty good so far, right? Well, sickness and wasting away both died. And as verse 5 in chapter 1 says, Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Now we'd say, well, that's pretty obvious. What's the big deal? I mean, it's sad. It's sad to lose a child. It's sad to lose your husband. Many of you know this personally. But anyone who was hearing this story back then knew it was even worse than that. Naomi was on her own now. She didn't have a man, or she couldn't be part of a male household somewhere. And I doubt any Moabite would bring her into their household. But it's even worse. Not only that, but she now had two daughters-in-law to take care of. When they married her sons, they became part of her family. They were her responsibility, even though she didn't have anything. She had no protection. She had no legal status. Butkus. Then, Naomi heard that there was food back home in Bethlehem. The famine was over. She decided to return home. She didn't have any close relatives back home, so she'd probably still be destitute. She'd still probably be a beggar on the streets, but at least she'd be among her own people. If you're going to be a begging Israelite, better be in Israel rather than Moab. Maybe someone will pity her. Maybe someone will take care of her. So as she prepared to go back home, her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, prepared to go back with her. I mean, after all, she was their family. It was their duty, it was their obligation to stay with her and to follow her. Naomi released them from that obligation. She said, you don't need to go home with me. Go back home. Go back to your mothers. She was offering them a kindness. She was giving them an opportunity to rejoin a household rather than be living adrift like Naomi. She was giving the, the opportunity to be back in a man's household. Maybe it was their father. If their fathers were dead, maybe they had a brother. But this was a double kindness. Not only was she giving them a chance to have a life, but she was also keeping them from having to go into the foreign territory, living in an enemy land to be treated as bad as Naomi was, had probably been treated while she was in Moab. This was a kindness on Naomi's part, and it was a sacrifice. Remember that part about whether or not a distant male relative will take you into their home? Remember I was talking about that? If you're old like Naomi, they're probably going to refuse because you don't have anything to offer. But if Naomi would go back and she's part of a package deal, you know, you get, you're taking me in, but you also get my two daughters-in-law. They're young, healthy, strong women who can contribute to the household. Well, then it would be a different matter, right? So by Naomi telling them, 
stay home, I'll go back by myself. She was making the sacrifice of making it much less likely that she would be able to find a safe, secure place to live. It was a kindness because it gave Orpah and Ruth a second chance. They still had a chance. They could remarry. They could build a new life. And they had no hope of that with Naomi. Naomi said, I imagine rather sarcastically, what? Do you think I'm going to get married today and have babies that are going to be born immediately? And even if I did, even if I had two twin boys, what are you going to do? Are you going to wait until my babies are grown-ups, until you're going to marry them? That's ridiculous. You can't do that. That's not going to work. Go back home. You don't have any future with me. So Orpah did the sensible thing. Orpah accepted Naomi's kind, sacrificial offering. Oh, it broke Orpah's heart. Orpah was in tears as she did so. But no one can blame her even the slightest bit for what she did. Orpah did what was smart and wise. And then there was Ruth. There was stubborn, bull-headed Ruth. There was Ruth that you couldn't tell her what to do. There was Ruth, she didn't have sense enough to take care of herself. No offense to those of you here in the congregation named Ruth. You see, Ruth had made a commitment. Ruth had made a commitment to Naomi when she married her sickly son. She made a commitment to be her family, to be her family no matter what happened to that family. And so as Naomi tried to talk some sense into Ruth, Ruth uttered some of the most powerful words of scripture. Ruth declared the fullest expression of devotion one person could ever offer to another. Don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Powerful words, right? If you're Baptist, you say amen, right? All right, close enough. Let's look at that last line, though. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. There's two things to notice here. First of all, Ruth is announcing her faith in the Lord. She makes this promise based on the Lord, the God of Israel. She doesn't say anything about the Moabite gods that she had grown up worshiping. No, she had abandoned the gods of Moab. She was already yoking herself to Naomi's faith. When she said, your God will be my God, too late. She already was. But the second thing, look at that. It's a curse. Ruth is calling a curse down upon herself if she fails to follow through on her commitment. May the Lord deal with me even death separates us. Now contrast that with the blessing that Naomi had given to Ruth and Orpah earlier. Earlier, Naomi had said, may the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Ruth was willing to abandon a blessing and put herself under a curse. Wow. Wow. Ruth said, my very life will be defined by your life. Whatever and whoever you are, that's who I am. I will set aside everything that defines who I am in order for me to be with you. I'll set it all aside. I'll give it all up. I am ready to plunge into the great unknown because of my love for you. Does that remind you of anyone? Does that remind you of anyone who said, I will give up everything because of my love for you? Anyone? That's right, Jesus. Remember, when in doubt, if a preacher asks you a question, the answer is usually either God or Jesus. Jesus did exactly that. 
He left the security and the promise and the peace and the rest of heaven in order to journey into our land, in order to bind his fate to our fate. Before Jesus died, he said to his disciples, and this is what we read together earlier, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. What does it mean to lay your life down for someone? What's that? Make a risk for them. Lots of different things. Now, often when we think about, would, you, would I give up my life for someone? Would I lay down my life for someone? A lot of times it's easier to think about the big flashy things. Like, yeah, I take a bullet for them. I would put myself in front of the speeding bus or train. Those are the big flashy ones. But to lay your life down for someone else, it's in the ordinary, everyday times of our lives that it really matters. To lay your life down for someone else means... I'll be the one to get up to see who's at the door so you can sit and relax. I'll be the one who goes and makes a phone call to you rather than vice versa. I'll be the one who, uh, or you will be the one, sorry, you will be the one to decide where we're going to go out for lunch, what movie we're going to see, if we ever get to see movies outside of our houses again. This is what laying down our lives mean. Laying down our lives means doing what Ruth did. Ruth demonstrates what following Jesus' example and what following Jesus' command can look like. Ruth demonstrates for us a love for us to emulate. And I think this is particularly important for us because we live in a culture that tells us, look out for number one. No one else is going to look out for you. You better do it yourself. No. Jesus says, look out for each other. And Ruth says, I'm going with you. I'm going to let you read the rest of Ruth's story yourself. It's not that long of a book. You'll be able to do it pretty quickly. Let me give you away a little bit of the punchline, a little bit of a uh, spoiler alert, sorry. Ruth became Naomi's salvation. And eventually, Ruth had a son. And Ruth's son had a son. And her grandson had a son. And do you know what her great-grandson's name was? This is the one where God and Jesus is not the answer. Her great-grandson was David, the greatest king that Israel ever had. And many generations later, another one of Ruth's descendants became a king. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest king of all, Ruth was salvation for Naomi, and Jesus Christ, her descendant, is salvation for us all. This is what love looks like. Would you pray with me, please? Lord God, we are grateful not only for your example of love, but for Ruth's example as well. Teach us, Lord, how we can lay our lives down for one another. Show us what it means for us to commit ourselves to those whom we care for. Amen.